Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 to 7. We're going to talk mostly about 5, 6, and 7. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, since the key to be of one the same mind in the Lord, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If the church is to show the world what it means to live in the peace of Jesus Christ, we have to stand fast in the Lord. We need to be firm in our walk with God. We count, we count on His strength, His grace, and we stay close and consistent with Him. We trust in His strength, not our own sufficiency. We make the decision to never give in to evil. And in spite of fear, in spite of relentless attacks, we decide that we will never go back on our commitment to Christ. We will never back away from Christ. And I don't have to have an answer for everybody that attacks me. And I don't have to win every battle. And I don't have to always be the pillar of strength. We don't always have to win. But we always have to stand. We always have to remain strong. To do that, there are steps we need to take. We've already talked about two steps, two principles. Number one was to be united as a church. The two ladies in the church were struggling. The Apostle Paul says, help these two ladies to unite. We talked about the fact that you don't let difficulties that are taking place in the church get outside of the church. Don't talk about them at work. Don't talk about them with your friends. Remain in the church and bring unity here. The world loves to see a church divided. Even if it's not really divided. The world wants, or God wants us to remain united. The second one was rejoice. And remember, it's not rejoicing that we muster up on ourselves. It's a word that has the same root word, the same foundational word as the word grace. Nobody tries to muster up grace. We understand that grace is unmerited favor. It's a gift from God. Well, so is rejoicing. Rejoicing is not something we do. It is something we are given and then are able to manifest in our lives of so those two things. Now, we're going to reach a third principle today. However, unlike the first two principles, which are things that we do, the third principle is not something we do. It's something we need to understand. Right? So, in our standing fast for God, there are things we do, and there are things we need to know. There are things we do, and there are things we need to know. Today is something we need to know. So we begin in verse 5. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I don't like the fact that some translations translate as gentleness. And look through several translations. Some translate it differently. The King James says moderation. The New International says gentleness. The New King James says gentleness. The New American Standard says gentle spirit. The American Standard says forbearance. The Amplified says gentle spirit. But then, of course, Amplifies it to say graciousness, unselfishness, mercy, tolerance, and patience. And then mine's word study is my favorite. The word study book, uh, com not a commentary, the word study defines it as gentleness. And get this one, I want you to remember this, okay? Sweet reasonableness. Is that not great? Does that not define what we need to be? We don't need to just be reasonable. We need to be sweet about it. Not obstinate annoyance. Not obstinate irrationality. Sweet reasonableness. And I 
you know, they did a quite a bit of study on that particular word. I think that's where I think that's really the best definition. Merriam-Webster defines it as avoiding extremes of behavior and expression. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. Let me talk about what one commentator says. So you get all excited about this. I forget what I'm doing. One commentator says, we may understand him, or Paul, as exhorting him to endure all things through equanimity. Now stop. I had no idea what equanimity meant. I thought it meant being equal. So I put it in here, the definition. Okay? Equanimity is mental calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in difficult situation, in a difficult situation. Now, I know that all of you knew that, but I didn't, so I'm putting it up there for me, all right? That's what equanimity means. It means calmness. That has nothing to do with being equal. I love the English language. All right, let's start from the beginning. We may understand him as exhorting them to endure all things with equanimity. This is a term that is made use of by the Greeks themselves to denote moderation of spirit. When we are not easily moved by injuries, when we are not easily annoyed by adversity, but retain equanimity of temper. And that was John Calvin. Again, I think we come back to this whole thing, this sweet reasonableness. I'm reasonable, and I'm sweet about it. I enjoy being who I am. Finish this verse, if you know it, okay? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I thought it would be screamed louder than that. <laughs> self-control, against such there is no law. That's moderation. Self-control. I'm in control of what I'm doing. I, I, I have a couple of slides here to demonstrate moderation or this sweet reasonableness, this moderation. So this is what I want, okay? And don't kid yourself, I can pound that in a day and then whine to my wife that I have heartburn, okay? Now compromise says I should do this. Moderation says I should do this. But that's boring, okay? All right, well, there's this, okay? This is what I want. By the way, that is my favorite chip. And again, kills me. This is what I should do. But this is what compromise is. This is what I should do. Okay? A better illustration would be this. This is sometimes how we want to act. Uncontrolled anger. This is a compromise. But moderation, what we really should be doing is this. Okay? So moderation is knowing what we want, knowing what we can do, and doing what we should do. That's what moderation really is all about. We're exhorted to gentleness, moderation, calmness. Let people see that we are under control. And, and, and even maybe not even under my control, rather the control of the Holy Spirit, standing <coughs> firm in the Lord's meaning with Standing firm in the Lord means living a moderate, self-controlled life. We cannot let things get under our skins. Now, we can be passionate about stuff. And, and you know that, that sometimes, and particularly on some subjects, I get going up here. We can be passionate. But we can't let those issues control how we act or how we, how we react, we cannot let these things push us over the edge. They cannot control our responses and our reactions. We demonstrate moderation and calmness and gentleness. Even though we may be passionate about something and maybe even speaking at a high level, we, it's not controlling us. You don't have to walk on eggshells when you're around me. Okay? That's moderation. If somebody's always afraid that they're gonna, something they say is going to tick you off and push you over the edge, that's bad, okay? We live in moderation. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Let your moderation, your self-control, your calmness, that even if you are worked up about a subject, you're demonstrating control, you're demonstrating moderation and all that. But remember, okay, go back to what I said in the beginning. Demonstrating and exercising moderation is not the principle that we're going to talk about of standing firm in the Lord. 
Moderation, calmness, is an example of understanding the principle that Paul is giving us here. But it's not the principle. This is the response to the principle. So you say to me, well, preacher, what is that? What is the principle you're talking about? I'll get to that in a minute. First of all, let's keep going in verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Don't be, don't stew about life. Uh, it means to relax. Don't get uptight and worry over, over the future or what's happened in the course of your life. It carries us to passages like Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Stay calm. Don't worry. It takes us to Matthew chapter 6. Which talks about the lilies of the field. Well, they're not clothed better than anybody in the sanctuary today. Talks about the birds of the of the sky. Does not God know when one sparrow falls from the sky? God knows it. And if, if Matthew six says, if God takes care of all that, how much more important are you than lilies and sparrows? He'll take care of you. Number one, because you're His creation. He takes care of His creation. Number two, He'll take care of you because you're His child. He takes care of His children. Don't be anxious, don't be nervous, don't be scared. And it's great because not only does the Bible tell us what not to do, it tells us what to do. Continue on in verse 6. Um, don't be anxious, be not anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. When we sense or know of a need that's coming, a need that arises, we're to take it to God in prayer. We're to take it to the Lord. We're to take it to Him. You know, there's two verses that jump out at me, not often, but enough. And one of them is, I believe it's in Timothy. And Timothy says, we're not given a spirit of fear, but of love, and of power, and of sound mind. But that first part, we're not given a spirit of fear. But sometimes I'm afraid. And then I remember what David said, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Right? And so we don't have that spirit, but it doesn't mean we're never fearful. But what we do is we come to God and go, here it is, Lord. Here it is. The example of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the king of the enemy, is coming and thundering. And one of his tactics was to demoralize the people. He would send his messengers, and they would stand on a, a, a raised spot. They would stand outside the city. And they would, they would tell the inhabitants, you're going to lose. They would try to demoralize them. You're going to lose. You're going to die. We're going to kill you. And we're going to do all this stuff to you. And Hezekiah said, look, can, can you not speak in our language? Because you're bothering the people. So Sennacherib sent this letter to Hezekiah telling all the horrible things he can do. And Hezekiah takes that letter and he takes it to the altar and he spreads it before the Lord. He goes, God, look at this. God, do you see this? It's exactly what God asks us to do. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. When you're afraid, take those things lay them on the altar and say, God, do you see what he's saying about you? And in that story, God drives the enemy away and they leave and Israel doesn't have to lift a finger. But it's an incredible story. Cast all your cares upon him. Be anxious for nothing. So when we are tempted to be afraid or concerned or challenged, when the finances aren't coming in and we need those finances, when the diagnosis isn't what we had hoped it would be, when the family member still rejects the Christ that we know can bring them peace, when our children are still wandering and we're just wondering when God's getting a hold of them, Lord, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, I'm going to lay these things before you. Prayer is important. Ian e. Bounds says this, the prayer closet is the battlefield of the church. It is its citadel, the scene of heroic and unearthly conflicts. The closet is the base of supplies for the Christian and the church. Cut off from them, there is nothing left but retreat and disaster. The energy for work, the mastery over self, the deliverance from fear, all spiritual results and graces are much advanced by prayer. And let me just point out that as we talked about earlier, self-control and moderation, know that he, notice that Ian Bounds says that prayer is also the key to mastery over yourself. How many of you have got on your knees and said, God, get me under control? God, get me under control. I'm out of control. William Barclay says, 
It may be that one of our great faults in prayer is that we talk too much, listen too little. When prayer is at its highest, we wait in silence for God's voice to us. We linger in His presence for His peace and His power to flow over us and around us. We lean back in His everlasting arms and feel the serenity of perfect security in Him. And then Martin Luther said, To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And we see the results. The peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And, I, and, and those two have to go together. Not only do I have peace of heart, but I have peace of mind. I don't understand why. It's a peace that passes even my own understanding. I don't know why I'm at peace. I still don't have enough money to pay the rent. The diagnosis is still stage four. My children are still wandering for God. My best friend is still rejecting Christ. And yet I'm at peace. Why? Because that's the principle. That's principle number three. And principle number three is this. It comes out of verse five, I believe. Not I've forgotten. It comes out of verse five, the very end of it. The Lord is at hand. The Lord said, "How can I be at peace when nothing has changed?" And this is how I can be at peace. It's because God is right here. God is right here. If I'm going to stand fast in the Lord, if I'm going to stand firm in God, I have to have this understanding that the Lord is here. The Lord is with me. God is here all the time. Now let's take it in two different ways. Number one, the Lord, the Lord is at hand. I don't have to look around to find Him. He's right here. As soon as I call, boom, He's there. I might move. I might not feel it. I might not sense Him. But guess what? He's still there. Why? Because God is always close. God is always close. At hand. The second one, the second way to take it is this. The return of the Lord is quick. It's going to come quickly. I firmly believe that the Lord returns is, well, I'll say closer now than it was a year ago or ten years ago, which is obvious, but I believe I believe circumstances are coming into line that directly fulfill Scripture. One of, the, one of the things that Scripture talks about just before the return of the Lord is this. When they begin happening, they will begin happening faster and faster. And you look at the way society is going now. We go from immorality to immorality so far. We can't even give up on which morals we need to fight. I believe the return of the Lord is quick because things are happening very, very rapidly, very, very fast. And we need to be ready for the Lord to come. We need to be ready for Him to be here. But you know something? I'm okay with that. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Because God is here. Guess what? He's got this. Right, Diane? He's got this. She gave me a little flat and said, God's got this. God is never surprised. God is never outnumbered. God is never overwhelmed. God is never upset. God is never out of control. God knows before the heathen what they're going to do. God knows before we sin what sin we're going to commit. God understands this. And so we talk about standing fast in the Lord. We need to be united and we need to be rejoicing. But we need to understand that God is right here. And He will take care of us. And God is right here. And He's coming soon. We need to be ready for that. And so I'm going to take these things. And we need to take these things with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to the Lord. The principle is this. Stand fast in the Lord. Because He is always close by why can, I, why can I be united? Because God is here. Why can I rejoice? Because God is here. Why can I be at peace? Because God is here. Why can I stand fast? Because God is here. I get that. I get that. And when we truly understand that, we're ready for whatever the world can throw at us. Because whatever the world throws at us, God catches and handles and takes care of. So now we have three guidelines, three principles. Be united, stand together, rejoice in the rejoicing that Christ gives, and know that God is close. Let's pray.